But I want to reassure everybody here that everyone here has the ability to remote view. Everybody can essentially do this. Um, I was like looking up a remote view picture. It's not the best, but it kind of gives some insight. It's just a little picture here that kind of, you know, exemplifies what we're doing, you know, as planetary core grid, re grid readers, remote viewers, we're, you know, overseeing objectively the Earth's holographic spiritual architecture. Um, so remote viewing, uh, well, hang on one second. Let me, got to pull up the chat. Okay. Whenever I switch screens, I lose the chat box. Um, so this is essentially, this is a, an, a learned ability, okay, where you're able to transcend space and time to view persons, places, things, energies, spirits, that spiritual planetary holographic architecture, geometries, you're able to remote into space time to gather and report information on the same. This is really at the core basis of what grid working is. We are becoming observers of the planetary divine energy seen through lenses of heightened awareness. Now, the technicalities of what you're really doing is activating the learned ability of two inherent kinesthetic human activities. So this is to psychically detect and decode Okay, kinesthetic means that we're relating to a person's awareness of the position of movement of the parts of the body by means of sensory organs. Okay, so I kind of want to bring the organ part up because I think this is not that I have all of the information on this, but I think it would be a good deep dive. Um, but we have 12 main organs that we're most conscious of. But all together in the body, there's 78 main organs within the human body. So everything kind of being perceived as an organ, like even the, vag the vaginal cavity, like the anal cavity, like things like this, these are actually perceived as organs. So total, we have 78 main organs within the human body. And these organs work in coordination to give rise to organ systems um, they're needed for our vital survival. I think five out of the organs are needed for vital survival, but each of these organs has a sensory perception. So they're all psychically picking up on different things. Um, so we really have quite the infinite spectrum when we really get into what the organs can psychically pick up on. Um, the unconscious, I would say, are operating from the five basic senses, right? There's not much beyond that. The conscious are using about seven, five basics and two psychic senses. And the super conscious are using about 12 senses. Um, this is, yeah, and, and glands as well. Yes, that's, that's correct. And I'm wondering if the 78 organs is also including some of these glands, glandular systems. I think it is. Um, so yeah, using the five big basic senses and then seven super conscious senses that maybe we're not able to totally define, but we're still using, we're still using them. So that all really ties into it. And I know this is true because I myself personally, when I've had certain remote use come in that have been involuntary, um, I have felt subtly on a quantum level within my own body through like electrical pulse charges that those visions were coming from organs. They were coming either from my womb, my ovaries, my kidneys, my pancreas, my spleen, that they were being generated from per certain parts of the body. So I think this is an interesting component of remote viewing that maybe hasn't been like fully delved into, but I do think that um, it's, it's definitely you know, relative to remote viewing, how you can interpret your remote view through particular organs is definitely very interesting. Um, I would say, you know, being female, being a woman, a woman, my womb is almost just as active psychically as my third eye. 
So yeah, I think there's a lot of correlation. You're right from glands, organs, and chakras that they are working um, as a trifecta for for psychic vision. Um, having that said, though, in high level remote viewing. Um, I do think what we're actually doing, though, is we're connecting into an eight-dimensional waveform expression and higher um, that takes us through infinite mind fields because that's what each one of us are. We're essentially transmitters of that infinite mind field. And I say eight-dimensional and higher because that's where we attain awareness outside of the body. So it's kind of like the remote viewing is really taking place 8D and higher because 7D and lower is consciousness that's perceived totally or is coming through more through the matter, matter fields of the body. So we have these target locations. We're pulling things from the 8D wave spectrum and higher. And then we're pulling this through the earth or organic systems, through the man-made stargates, vortexes, ley lines, whatever it may be of data. And then we're breaking it down into a fourth dimensional thought form. So pertaining to energy, depth, form, and time. And then to further objectify that into a two-dimensional or three-dimensional description as well, when you're writing it down, right? And you're putting it into more objectivity. So this is kind of the technical description, pulling data out of the ether. Um, I know it kind of sounds like a lot, but essentially we're going to kind of break it down some more. So remote viewing for grid working is essentially psychic detecting and decoding. That's basically what you're doing. You're detecting energy signatures, you're decoding them, you're breaking them down, you're detecting and decoding holographic energy architecture and structures, natural and inorganic. You're detecting and decoding living energy and dead energy particle or antiparticle like you're you're the differentiations of these things you're decoding mid-world higher harmonic worlds living bodies within them angelic realms magical kingdoms you're detecting and decoding spirits souls emotions mental bodies attachments infiltrative energy oppressive energy dense energy hijacked templating all kinds of differentiations and energy, dimensions and timelines, Akashic fields, the hall of records. We are detecting and decoding all probable forms of consciousness, subconscious and unconscious information and data. And the way you learn this is to familiarize yourself with these things. So to practice psychic depth perception, to be activated to the signatures of floating awareness, because that's really where a lot of this is taking place is in the float state. Okay. And that requires also having activated your Merkaba, okay. Particular holographic structures that exist within your own energy field to be able to allow you to get into that float state. I really feel that the Merkaba at the core levels is connected to the male and the female energies, the masculine and the femininity. So having both of those active and connected to both of those in your field is what's going to allow you to get into the Merkaba or activate that holographic structure, which is your vehicle, which then allows floating, right? Floating is just the way that I describe the state that I'm often in when I'm most psychically attuned. It's it's like a free form state where you're able to kind of move and navigate within those higher dimensional wave fields of the mind. Um, so accessing the heights of your imagination, merging with the growing of your intuition and grounding this into your gnosis. It's all about learning the signs and the symbols of the divine. So synchronization, hints, cues, gestures, signatures, frequency, initiative vibrations. Can you recognize if a vibration changes and shifts? These are all particular things in your mind that you already may know or not know, but you're waking up to remember more of it. 
So you're detecting and decoding through an alpha brainwave state. So this is kind of like an altered state. And then you're perceiving data of modalities. So what you're perceiving could be radial, it could be digital, it could be artificial, it could be um, electromagnetic, it could be organic, it could be tactile, it could be auditory, clairvoyant, clairsentient, claircognizant, and you're really learning like the differentiations between those. This is how you attain psychic depth perception. Um, Noko says she's been wanting to do Qigong with her eight-year-old medicine man of a son. Thanks for the confirmation there. I think Qigong, that's like the slow movements, right? Of spiritual movements. Yeah, I think that is really good for developing these senses. Oh, okay. Ananda says she experienced a floating state while doing a Qigong kidney packing exercise yesterday. Yeah, I think that Qigong really helps with this. I think anything that moves the body helps with this. Dancing, because it, it allows you to let go of the mind and then really focus on energy and feeling. And that oftentimes will bring a lot of download through. Um, the more that you attune yourself to these things, you're going to become heightened. You're going to become keen of your own body's responses to mirrored reflections of the earth's field. So that means that if you slow down and just focus on subtlety of energy, you will see that every ache that you have, every pain that you have, every cramp, every pressure, every pinching, every squeezing, every movement inside you, okay? It's not just for nothing. And, and you probably have, like I'm having things right now. Like right now I'm having, I can feel energy moving up and down my neck. I can feel pressure across my forehead, a little bit across here. I mean, it's really slowing down and feeling what in the body is telling you that energy is moving, holding your breath. A lot of sometimes we unconsciously hold our breath, um, autonomic functioning, okay. Mannerisms, your mannerisms will shift and change as energy and spirit moves through you, right? It's a total bodily resonance that's responding 24 seven to your spiritual environment. And you can literally sit here and read that frame by frame, second by second, minute by minute. You could literally remote view yourself on that piece of paper. Everything you think, feel, and experience energetically, every single thing you feel as each minute every, and every second and every hour moves by, something is moving in you. This is how you can utilize this perception to remote view and to gain and detect and decode more in the land, in the grids, to the stargates, to the buildings around you. So this means to stop justifying things. Um, this means to stop justifying that slight forehead headache that you had with this age old thing, you know, telling yourself for years, why you get them. Okay. Take a more objective perspective, read deeper into every detail from now on. Like, where were you standing when it came on? What part of the house were you in? I mean, you could probably pick up on a ley line this way. Um, what direction were you facing? What energy did you feel when you noticed it in your body? How does the accumulative energy of that headache feel like it's moving in your body? All of these things here you notice are telling you signs of something more in the earth, in the atmosphere, in the environment, the field, restructuring of the field. Um, all of this is a part of the energy in which you are detecting and decoding. And these little subtleties become imperative when you're on location, when you're in the field to pick up on these. This is going to be, this is everything. So this is really all about paying attention to subtlety languages of the total mind, the body, the chakras, the organs, 
the glands and the meridian tonal lines in your body. Now, once we can accumulate and or observe our senses and bring our senses into a fourth dimensional thought form and then break that down, we can bring forth more accurate verbal data. So as long as that data is held in the mind and not put down into some sort of format where you can keep information, it really does considerably stay in a state of conceptual illusion. Because honestly, it's really not useful until it's more so objectified, which means basically you've written it down. But so when something stays in the mind, it continues to morph, it continues to flex, it continues to grow, it continues to shrink through infinite mind fields. And this is what conceptual illusion does. And this is kind of like the Maya of our mind. The Maya of our mind is living within the waveforms. Okay. And so that's constantly changing. And the way you can kind of see that is if you try to think back at something traumatic in your life, the more you dwell on it, the more it shifts, morphs, it starts redefining itself with every passing moment. It cannot and does not remain stagnant or fixed. That's because the waveform expression of some event in past time, even though it may have happened in the past, it's not really actually real anymore. It's now a Maya. It's now an illusion. This is why some of the best remote viewers, they're going to practice remote views with notes. They're going to practice remote views with writings, diagrams, sketches, um, of what they are seeing in that moment. They're going to turn it into a perception and capture something beyond illusion. So the best remote viewers are really aware of the waveforms and what and where and how they are tapping into this according to grid working. Um, the remote viewer becomes aware or perceives information during grid work session remotely or on location, and then they capture that information and that data. Um, now, when you're out on location, it's a little bit harder to do, but I do recommend taking a notebook with you when you're on location because you want to remember things. Some things that come through are very, very important, and you forget little details of that if you don't capture it when it happens. Um, and I think that details are imperative for remote viewing and they're imperative for grid working. The more details that are captured, the better the, the session and the more understanding of what needs to be done in that area and location in the grid that unfolds. Okay, so using a lot of language to express what you're seeing, try to really define what you're seeing, like color, light rays, flames, consciousness, feelings, emotions, pain, memories, texture, temperature, taste, sound, smell, all forms of energetic data, dimensional data, tangible and intangible data, elements, chemical reactions, holographic reactions, auric reactions. Okay. It's really like tuning yourself to these different types of things to take note of. Sometimes in the beginning, it can help to have protocols for detecting and decoding things you intentionally prompt yourself or ask yourself to sense um, and look at it within the attempt of the remote viewing and really maybe keep some sort of consistency in the way that you apply your remote view. Now, all of this might seem like a lot, but the truth is you're actually doing all of these things right now, all the time. Um, within this class and within this lesson, we're slowing down this awareness and making all of the details visible. We're also making all of the psychic processes more conscious. Uh, virtually every waking moment of your conscious life is filled with unconscious metatronomic activities of detecting that higher 8D waveform, mental waveform and higher and breaking that down to language that you can share through fourth dimensional to second dimensional experiences. 
I think that the best remote viewers are coming in at about 50 to 84% accuracy. That's about what I would rate my own self accuracy. Um, as I know that I don't have total vision, I don't have total 100% absolute clarity. Um, I wish that I did. That would be the coolest superpower in the world. Um, but I don't actually have, I mean, I do have a crystal in my mind, but I don't have like a total crystal ball where I can see, you know, everything. Um, but I do feel that it does come very close. Um, and oftentimes I do feel very accurate. But I do know that when the vision that I'm having comes through and it's also paired with re emotional resonance or it's paired with resonance of my chakras or fire in the elements of water, the vision of the remote view is most accurate. I get much more confirmation when it's paired with that additional resonance. I think the pairing of the mind and the emotion is like the actual synchronization force in the passageways of the space-time fields. So a merging of great truth that can open up to greater and higher levels of confirmation, knowing the feeling of these things that merges, that's imperative to higher levels of accuracy. Um, and so I think a way to reflect on that is really maybe look back on some of the involuntary experiences you've had. Maybe in times when you weren't trying so hard to, to have consciously a remote view experience, times where things just happened, um, focus on what you felt and how you felt when those things happened. And those are the subtle energy signatures you have to look for when attempting to do it consciously. Um, Noko told me the other day, <laughs> she said that she began channeling the right words to say when speaking to others, when she connected into a certain location in the grid that she was very fond of and connected to and brought her a lot of happiness and joy. And so as she was speaking, she felt herself merge with the landfield. She felt herself merge with that grid location. And so this was an activation simultaneously in deliverance. And so she was um, opening up and beginning to actually channel according to that merge that was taking place. Okay, so this is kind of how some of these experiences happen with remote viewing, with grid working, is you're going to kind of merge with those fields, and it's going to open you up to a deeper knowing around the awareness that merges and takes place as you activate more as a grid worker. For me, I feel like sometimes I do it so much with fluidity that I don't know sometimes anymore if I'm recognizing the differentiation of the switches. Sometimes I feel like um, I'm just innately going into something and I can pr prompt those psychic perceptions to just open up, I think, on cue. Um, but I have been working on this part of my psychic development for, I want to say, at least three or four years. And that's with actually developing my own attunements, which one I'm going to share with you today, to help open up those psychic minefields. So I've, it's not like this is, it's something you have to practice at. I think it's like a muscle. It's like um, something you get better at over time. The more that you, you know, practice and, and give yourself to it, that you get better and better at it. Um. I also think it helps for the body to be more pure. Um, it also helps for the body to be more holographic itself, which means less carbon-based. So very fluid energetically and very light, which you can feel when you're heavy, right? You can feel when your emotional body's heavy, when your energy body's heavy. You're not going to be able to remote view that well in those states. So you want to really focus on releasing attachment to things. I think that um, attachment can make it harder to have an uh, observable mind. Um, I think what can help 
men the most, men and women, but I think for men is to have more of a vegan or a vegetarian lifestyle, fasting lifestyle that serves the divine masculine a little bit more, I think, in getting into these states. Um, I think for women, it has a lot to do around the reproductive cycles, um, and that way they can harness more potential within their psychic abilities around these times. Um, I think you can do this, these things regardless of those conditions and regardless of you know, male and female when it comes to vegetarian or vegan fasting for these type of things. But um, I just noticed that some of the men that I have talked to that are really, really good remote viewers, they are doing more of a vegetarian lifestyle. Um, so I think it keeps them just their, their light body is lighter. And then for women, I think, yeah, that's the cycle, the reproductive energy that really for us can really open up some powerful psychic remote view abilities. But again, fasting, vegan, vegetarian lifestyle would apply to females as well. This really just means that you have to get the mind into a non-conceptual state, okay? You don't want to be thinking in terms of absolutes, okay? You don't want to be, you want to be willing to look at all of the pieces of information, facts, perceptions. Um, you have to be very open to other people's perceptions. You have to be willing to accept multiple versions of the truth, okay? If you can't accept multiple versions of the truth, remote viewing is probably not your thing because a lot's going to come in, a lot of different probabilities, a lot of different timelines, a lot of different, um, you know, potentials. And so you have to really be um, open to that, um, other people's perceptions, so the more you're willing to accept multiple versions of the truth, the more that you're willing to act in the moment versus worries or, you know, of the past or of the future, you're going to be able to create more of unlimited promise and potential within yourself and within your remote viewing abilities. Um, I think the body in all of these states, when you're attempting to remote view, should be calm. It should be at ease. It should be relaxed, have a general sense of wholeness, the heart needs to be open, the mind has to be open, um, anxiety levels have to be down to zero to none. I mean, you can still have these experiences if you're not, but you're going to have the best success if you can be in this state. Um, and the analytical process or the ability to reconstruct from memory or other variables in your mind um, should be happening purely in the moment as you attempt to remote view. So if the remote viewer can just let go and focus on the waveforms of the mind, the waveforms of the expression of the land, the waveforms of the vortexes, it's like seeing things through a waveform lens, right? Because um, there's waveforms that are emitting themselves through the grids. Okay, you can detect and decode into those waveforms um, with your eyes open or your eyes closed um, and then begin detecting, decoding, and then just finishing that remote view masterpiece. So I want to kind of provide another example to explore this. So I wanna invite you to just close your eyes for a moment. And I'm just going to prompt you to go to a beach, okay, in your mind, this might be a beach that you have visited before, it may be not, but I want to ask you to try to see this beach, okay, I and in this, in this, um, I want you to feel the beach, I want you to smell the beach in your mind, you can hear it, you can even taste it, right? You can explore and feel the temperature of the water, of the sand, of the air, okay? You can feel the heat of the sun on your flesh, your flesh, flesh bag. <laughs> um, the texture of the sand in your feet. All of this sensory information is available to you. It's really, truly, just by closing your eyes, 
and tuning into the speech, all of this sensory information is available to you. It's really a magical and comforting experience all at the same time. So I want to ask you now, where do you think all of this data is coming from? Where, where is it coming from? And if you guys want to respond in the chat, the field. Okay. The infinite field, for sure, it's coming from the infinite field. Who thinks it's coming from their imagination? You're not psychically, you're not, or you're not physically at the beach. So where does the data stream come from? If you decide that it may be imagination, then what is the origin of the imagination? Where does imagery data come from? What constitutes the imagination? I want to ask you guys, do you ever question why you were taught when you were a child to not trust your imagination, that you were taught that it's not real, that you were taught that it's bad? And I'm just saying this because I think that this is a real limiting fear program that is installed to us as children that needs to be collapsed. Um, that imagination somehow denotes illogical or not credible. Okay. Do you also realize that imagination and goals are one and the same? So if you have a goal that you're trying to set, you imagine that goal and create that reality in your mind, right? So they kind of sit within the same categorization of the mind field. The imagination has to be active to create a future probable timeline for you to live in that you are, you are thriving, creating a, a soul contract to agree to. And the goals are created in the imagery of your mind so that you can see it. Now, who here thinks that it's just recall that you can do this, that this is just coming from recall, it's just coming from memory, it's just coming from a fabrication of the scenario. Are you fabricating this from memory? Are you fabricating it from the recall of your mind? Or is it detecting and decoding waveform data and psychic si signatures that are relevant to the actual beach distance and space time? Okay, so I'm gonna tell you guys the truth. <laughs> The truth is that what we are doing when we're remote viewing is all of the above. We're doing all of the above. So the more that you practice all of the above, the more that you let go and attune yourself to the awareness of reading the waveforms of the collective mind, okay? You're through your imagination, through imagery, through recall and memories, okay? Because we're awakening to remember through fabrications as well. And also through detecting and decoding psychic signatures and spiritual confirmation. So the best remote viewers, they do not deny any aspects of their mind. Okay. They don't deny any of it. They give into all abilities of the mind and then they paint their world with it, right? They paint their canvas. They paint their picture. She says, so why, when I attempt to recall a certain beach, I kept getting drawn to a totally different beach persistently. There's probably a message in there for you. There's probably a reason why you're getting drawn to that beach. I would definitely give in to the vision and explore. I think it's just about trusting. It's about trusting this, okay? The truth is you're gonna produce a certain amount of data from all things. Um, this is why healing, 
Full acceptance of all aspects of yourself is crucial to becoming a strong grid worker. You cannot bring unhealed and unresolved baggage into the grid work or the remote viewing because it's going to quickly show up in a form of a blockage. So that might be a form of a blockage. Okay. If you're being pulled consistently to something else, it could be that you're blocked from this other thing. Okay. And that there's something there that has to be cleared as well. Um, I think that self-judgment also plays a role in this. We can be very critical of our abilities and then that can often block us even more. So I think if that's the case, you can really start to, you know, dig into your shadow body, your pain body, and these unhealed body parts of us, the depth of why we're blocked to try to remove more of that for remote viewing. Because I can promise you that your consciousness um, has the full ability to ride the sparking, sparkling neural networks of the brain, prompting it to release supplements of data embedded holographically in neurons of the cells of the biological brain and the cosmic brain and even beyond. So you're going to fabricate a certain amount of data. You're going to construct sensory data that will be as unique to the scenario as you are, okay? Um, your global past, your global current life experiences, your eternal records, your Akashic memories, they're all going to serve you the most here, okay? Because you're going to be recalling from these intelligent fields. There will also be certain amounts of data that match the beach in real time, okay? People on the beach, weather conditions, smells, emotions as they exist on the planet right now. And you will imagine a certain amount of that data and you will remember some from memory. This is the true story of remote viewing. All of these mental, emotional, energetic connections of the body form the center viewpoint of the lens of the pineal. So it's kind of difficult because I feel like it's an answer that a lot of people sometimes aren't necessarily satisfied with. Um, I think that one wants to kind of pick apart the differences between all of the tools of their mind and how it uses them to read the waveforms, how it uses them to interpret what it is they're sensing. And so there's a lot of discounting things. There's a lot of second guessing. There's a lot of question, questioning why they're being shown this or shown that. My greatest advice to you is to start believing everything that you are being shown, okay? No matter how crazy, no matter how far-fetched, how off the wall, how confusing it can be, okay? Unbelievable, ludicrous, ridiculous, whatever, however it sounds coming in, right? You just want to believe, you need to start believing that your mind your consciousness field, the parts of it that are even unconscious, okay, that it wouldn't bring things to you for no reason. That everything is conscious or everything that's becoming conscious is to be conscious. And this is the basis of beginning to trust your vision is to stop denying it, basically. Yeah, let's send it to Noko sister right now telepathically. We're all sending loving messages to Noko sister. Yes, trusting in yourself. Yes, surrendering 100%. Everything is quantum particles. Everything is dancing through filaments of radial connections all the time. It's all living all the time. And so time and space and distance doesn't really matter. Um, and we are these infinite beings with the power to love, to remote view, to see halfway across the entire world, and even into the cosmos. So what I want to do then is I want to actually practice some of this remote viewing. And I had picked out a couple locations for us to do this with. Yeah, and, and really, like, this is really, truly, this is something that the more you practice it, the more you develop it, the more you open up to it, the easier it becomes. 
and you become very fluid. And then I think it's, it's about, again, building the confidence to say what you're seeing and feeling out loud as well. I used to make myself a lot of psychic cue cards, to be honest with you, when I would pick things up. I have a, um, a technique that I had developed for myself when I, because for me, it was all about developing my own self tools because I would find things that would work for me, but I realized that trusting my own guidance as a teacher to myself was most important. In developing that also developed my ability to trust my own voice in myself. Um, but all of these things came through self-work, self-development. It took time. And so one thing that I did that I think really helps develop psychic perception was I took about 13 large cue cards um, and I essentially took two weeks um, activating one chakra in the body. So I took two weeks where I just simply did root chakra attunements, root chakra meditations, root chakra activations, did root chakra rituals, made a root chakra altar. I mean, everything was red. Everything was red jasper crystals, you know, and I invoked that within my field, within my consciousness. And once you invoke something in your field of awareness, it then goes through an unfoldment process. So what comes forward then is you're going to start actually manifesting things from the root chakra to come forward for you to see. Now, when that process starts happening, you're recording all of that information on your card. Okay. What do you see? What do you feel? What do you experience? Who came forward? What experiences came forward? What spirits came forward? What archangels came forward? You know, you're recording that unfolding and that attunement process with the root chakra. I did this for every single chakra in my body. And it took a really long time. It took like over a year because I took that process really seriously spending time within each phase of my field that in itself once you go through that there's this real deeper um, trust and knowing of what you're psychically perceiving because you're really trusting what you've experienced multi-dimensionally within all these dimensional frameworks of your field and you always have that to go back on and rely on you have your cue cards even if you forget right you can reattune yourself um so it's yeah, there's all kinds of little tools we can do for these things. Um, so let's practice some of this remote viewing. I'm sorry, I've had that up for a long time. But I'm now going to put up the Scribbles maps. If I can find it. Okay, so the, the first location that I want to uh, practice remote viewing is going to be, let's do the serpent mounds. I felt like really called to that one, and it was on my intro video. And I just think that this has really strong energy to connect into. Okay, so this is where your notebook and piece of paper will come in handy. Okay, so um, what I want you to do is just you're simply going to write down and draw what you see. Um, I really want you to just, you know, immediately feel into what are some of the things that immediately come to you just by looking at the scribbles map, looking at the picture, looking at the location, what just immediately comes to your mind and then write those things down. Starting here with the serpent mounds. So we're just gonna hover over the picture and I want you to take a moment to just take a really nice deep breath. Feel yourself go into a meditative state connecting with your psychic body, 
connecting with your astral body, connecting to your auric body, your causal field, your etheric, your light body, and just expand into that for just a moment. While simultaneously connecting into the land at the Serpent Mounds, feel into your psychically perceived environment, similarly to how you were recalling the beach. Okay, we're doing this at the Serpent Mounds. And then I want you to start just by jotting down some of your immediate observations. Can you feel the wind? Sometimes I like to actually see myself coming down from a pyramidal viewpoint, and I'm just kind of dropping down through a beam of light, dropping down through the sun, <laughs> excuse me, dropping down or sometimes coming up from the ground, coming up through inner earth portals, coming up through the ley lines, coming up through the waters. Okay. Everyone kind of has their own innate intuitive way they like to drop into a location but you're gonna feel into the weather. You're gonna feel into the environment. Start formulating your details. Feel and see yourself really come into this space. And when you do that, you can pick up on the temperature, the smell, the energy, the flow, the vibration, the sounds. What do you hear? Do you see symbols? Do you see codes? Do you see geometry? Do you see light? What color is it? Write all of these little details down. Really go through and attempt at describing as much details as you can. Let those details pull you further into your vision and your connection to the land. Okay, And as you get into more of those details, more details start to unfold or start to open up. Visualize that nothing you think and feel is wrong or right. Everything is observation for exploration. See if you can get even lighter in your energy and obtain the sense of the spiritual architecture here. Connect in with the waveforms of the mind within the expression of the land. What do you see? Does this pull you into more vision? And once you've done that, I want you to look for within the vision of the land's connection to its natural energy sources. So really start to pull yourself into more observational parts, okay? How does this location seem to energetically connect with its resources? The river, the trees, the forest, the sun, the moon. What do you see when you connect into the energy of its organic resources? Take note also of ley lines. So if you see and feel ley lines, just allow it to start pulling you in. The spiritual vision does tend to start to streamline and come on its own. Okay, so right now I'm kind of picking up with the serpent mounds. And you guys can drop in the comments too. If you see something, you sense something, feel something, I would love to share it out loud. Um, right now I am seeing that this serpent energy here, it's also connected to a larger snake. So I see like um, a green indigo snake and it looks like it's at the third eye, but then it extends down from the mounds. And it seems to encompass the globe. So I see like another serpent that's all around the, the earth field. Um, and then I also see it kind of showing me down itself along the west coast of South America that it's also connected to another serpent body that goes down South America. Okay, she's picking up on siphoning, hijacked, unbalanced, inversional energy. Okay, Ananda is picking up with alignment with stars, connecting earth to heaven, toroidal caves, underground. Yes, a lot of underground connections. I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting that too, like underground water caverns. I'm also seeing like an underground city up underneath, like it was built on top of a city. 
She's seeing glowing orbs around surrounding trees, blue reptile holding staff. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Kenzie's seeing a dragon. Tris is feeling her solar plexus spiral at the end of the tail. Yes, there's a spiral at the end of the tail. I think there's one at the end and at the beginning as well. Feel a power node at the south end about the underground water caverns feeding a river. Yes, dragons of creation. Yes, yeah, so these are all really good remote view observations. I was smelling campfire immediately, but also a dryness in the air. I'm also getting like conflicting energies, like conflicting, like genetic DNA codes, like kind of warfare over the serpent mound, like control, uh, control, um, resentful energies. Conflicting energies, smoke, ceremonial site would be walked on from the north. Um, I'm also getting that there's also a lot of heart energy here. Like this is really also heart chakra. Um, oh, I'm getting that this is connected to Quetzalcoatl as well, or the um, Kukulkan of the Mayas. Yes, yes, I'm getting ancient Mayan energy. It, it's and it's not like it's um directly connected that it's come down through dissension or it's come down through parting of family lines. Um, I'm also seeing that it's a temple. This is a temple of some sort, but they've seen it as a temple. Yeah, lost tribes, Aztec as well. Yes. Ancient Incan, yes. Um, I'm also seeing there's like crystal codes underneath the mound. Um, and that those crystals are extraterrestrial crystals. So they're not from Earth. Noko said she's seen an octahedron when I tapped into the spiritual body. Okay. Very. Yes, I think it's really important to tune into the geometric structures that are running underneath. If you can, as much as possible, those can be fluctuating. I'm getting druid energy condenser. Trees have information to share. So yeah, there's a lot of um, codes that I think are really coming through this location. Yeah, well, <clears throat> what I really picked up on this when I went there was its connection to the meteorite impact. So I guess this whole site was built into a meteorite impact. Um, and I think that's what makes it such a magical crystallized experience is you're really picking up on these alchemical compositions that are not of earth. Watch your energies in the tree lines. Ooh, wow. Yeah, guardian spirits. Guardian spirits for sure. Yes. I picked up on a cool temperature energy immediately. Oh, okay. So it looks like there's, yep, there's a little creek down here. So there's our natural energy resource. I also get that this is this is really off the grid. So there's not, I, I, the thing is, is I really, even though there's like a, a level of hijacking here, I'm also getting that there's a, a huge level of just like untouched organic, still holding like or, uh, plugged into organic systems and organic codes. So you can actually pull this for, you know, organic templating that this still actually is here. Feels like galactic kundalini activation to me for heart expansion supported by crystalline structures. I immediately felt the rainbow serpent energy. 
cosmic serpent, mini geometries, colors, cosmic mind, Troid, the serpent being frequency wants to come through to hear, to heal fear in the deepest level. This is a powerful portal if we are willing to resonate. And there is infinitely more than this. I was there in October. Yeah, this is a really powerful site, guys. If you haven't been to the Serpent Mounds, I would really highly recommend going. It's definitely worth the trip. Um, it's very activated. If I zoom out, looks like horns or antlers on an animal. I mean, yeah, I could definitely see that. Like as if this is the body. Oh, wow. Like this could be the body of something here. This whole part. That's interesting. Yes. Like, like a moose. <laughs> like a something that's very large with antlers elk potentially neptune sisterhood of the serpent still steward them land so yeah so you can see how just practicing you know we're already picking up on so much as a group here and this is exactly what you know, I, how I want it to be when we come in for our last grid work ceremony, except we're going to be live. Everybody's going to be up on the video. Everyone's going to be able to transmit this stuff verbally. So, um, how everyone's like kind of chiming in and really giving what they see, what they feel. This is exactly what we want for that grid work we do. So the next one I wanted to do was Niagara Falls. So let's just take a second to really tune into this site, this location. Um, again, really feel into what you're psychically perceiving in the environment at the Niagara Falls. Um, start by jotting down those observations, those immediate observations, the things that immediately start coming through to you, the imagery, whatever it is, start jotting it down. Um, start picking up on as you're actually coming in, like see yourself come into that field. Again, the wind, the weather, the environment, really take note of these things. This pulls you more into that energy. Notice the detail of the essence of the energy. Temperature, smells, mist. I'm getting mist and steam. I'm getting cold mist and steam. Like it's, it's, um, it's really cool. Flow, energy, vibration, sounds. It's very loud. It's very loud. Okay. Do we see symbols? Do we see codes? Do we see geometry? Do we see light? Orbs floating over the falls. Ooh, wow. Pretty. What colors? <laughs> really go through and attempt at describing as much details as you can. Let those details pull you more and further into your vision. It's a stargate. It's definitely a stargate. I mean, this, this, and that's why I wanted to do this one, you guys. Um, I have been seeing here for a while that the Niagara Falls is, I don't know if it's a stargate or if it's like a portal that's taking us into the seven higher harmonic universes. Like I keep seeing it as a gateway that unicorns are using to come in and out, centaurs are using to come in and out, cherubims are using to come in and out, that it's like an access point that they go through the waters. Um, I've been seeing it really as a, ma a magical passage point. She feels activation of her sacral chakra, the falls and the islands feel like they have circular energy clockwise. Yes, it does. Oh, I'm really getting Andromeda as soon as you said that. Yes, to Stargate saw it immediately. Powerful energy, hidden caverns, portals. Yes. It's almost like there's some sort of interdimensional, like heavenly city in, even in the land itself, like in the ground. Um, I'm seeing that. 
I'm getting peace codes. I'm getting doves. The dove grid, the dove grid templating comes from here. Connect with this area right away. Then the falls look like the vaginal passageway to birth. Yeah, definitely. It's a lot of liquid, <laughs> a lot of water, a lot of emotions, a lot of birthing. Yeah, primordial waters, definitely. Energetic whirlpool with two circles rotating in the opposite direction. Whirling chopper sound. You know, we've honestly, and I think I've probably talked about this in some of my other course classes, we have um, used the Niagara Falls as a landing zone a lot. It's just, it's a beautiful place and space. Her higher heart is getting super activated. It's kind of like not, the Niagara Falls has the ability to just obliterate all density in the sacral chakra because it's such, it's powerful waters. It's not just, I mean, it's, oh, I'm also picking up on like secret underwater tunnel systems to secret underwater cities. And I kept seeing like Lake Michigan. I keep seeing like the five um, superior lakes, Lake Superior, like the waters are connected here. And it's bringing through some of the, the codes. Clouds, man-manipulated weather, feeling very light. This place has always felt very magical to me. Lived there as a child briefly. Angelic. Yeah, I get a lot of angelic energy here as well. Jenny is five minutes from Lake Superior. Shout out to the Great Lakes in the house. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's definitely, there's a lot. And I, I think this would be a fun one to remote view would be the Great Lakes because I know there's a lot under those lakes. I think there's, there's cities. I think cities have been found, honestly. So yeah, uh, Niagara Falls, this is a great landing zone for your templating. Um, if you're looking for a place to drop in for your group, I would say this is definitely a, a safe place to do it. Um, and it can help bring people in through the waters. It's like working directly through the water element. And that can be very soothing, very nurturing, very feminine. Okay, so let's do another one then really quickly, since we're going to be <clears throat> heading a Washington, D.C. Uh, group mission. Let's just look at Washington, D.C. for a second. Now, we've looked at some places here that are kind of a higher vibration or higher frequency, and now we're going to kind of look at um, some reversal energy here. Yeah, big difference for sure. This is all I mean, you can see city, man-made structures, artificial frequency, shield up. Yeah, if you need to put your shields up, if you need to set protections quickly, go ahead and do that. Um, We're just going to kind of do like a brief, br brief, we're not going to do any work here. We're not going to, you know, make, set any intentions. We're just... We're just, um, we're scouting. We're scouting right now. I just felt and saw this huge counterclockwise energy that moved through Canada and U.S. spinning out any dead energy that is ready to be lifted out of the earth. Really powerful and beautiful. That's good. She feels Saturn and broken goat arms, horns. Uh, so this, now I don't know if you guys know, but I don't know if you can see all these point locations. So I think the White House is here. But if you move from the White House to this point and then across, it's over here to Westminster and then back down to Foggy Bottom and then across to Mount Vernon Square, this actually creates like an upside down pentacle. So this is 
when someone asked me that earlier, if the upside down pentacle meant something, this is running geographically in the landmass encoding a upside down pentacle. Black goo, dark, drippy. Yeah. Oh, no. I, so I was actually remote viewing in on this last night because I was kind of preparing for today with you guys. And what I immediately seen coming into the land was like fields and fields of serpents, like entities or like spirits of serpents, but they were um, not, they were like of like Anunnaki or draconian like serpent bodies. Like they weren't, you know, I don't think all serpents are bad. I'm Hydra Starseed. So, um, but these ones were like creating like a boundary or like a force field all around the area. So if you actually walk into here, you're going to, you're going to be like being attacked by serpent energy, like very um, venomous spews of reactions and actions and the way people talk to you, treat you, because they're all going to be like embodied with the serpent, um, which, and then it was showing me how the serpent is always like going back and forth like this, because they are the serpent in the body is what decides what's food and what's not. And it was showing me that this going back and forth was them trying to decide who was going to be their food and what was going to not be their food. Um, a lot of death here, war commanders, both coming from below and above is the block of dark energy. Yes. Very 5G. Yes. AI influence. Yes. I feel a phallic energy here, but not a nice one. <laughs> yes. There is an obelisk here in Washington, D.C. Commanders and defenders. Yeah. Um, let's see if we can zoom in. So this is the White House. Now, I was told that, whoa, and immediately as I said that, I just got this like disoriented wave form that hit me. So it was almost as if like they have, they definitely have penetratable like scalar wave forces trying to block remote viewers from this. Um, yeah, it almost felt like I was hit with something disorienting in my mind. Buried bodies, psychic warfare for sure. Well, I think the CIA, you know, they have groups here that I think this is what they do all day is they probably block remote viewers. So this is definitely a very hard site to remote view. powerful angelic portal overlaid with military blocking waves of energy. I wonder if we can locate where the angelic portal is here. That's a really good idea. If we can find like its organic resources, what do we have here? Oh, Potomac, Potomac River. Okay. Wow. Okay. Wow. That river is probably polluted to all, you know what? Um, yeah, we got to find out where the potent energy resources are and see if they're still al alive. Here, a soldier's march, foggy bottom intersection. What's that dark body of water there? Which way down here in here? Tidal Basin, Southwest Washington, there's a channel. I'm wondering if these islands probably, what is this here? It's like some sort of dome, some sort of a place to go and view the water, it looks like. Looks like. Oh, it looks like the White House has a queen bee tied up in restraints. Explain more about that. A beacon of sorts. I feel a central energy like in the center of the city grid connects deep earth and higher dimensions. I mean, let me take a look here. Where is Washington, D.C. in relativity to other things here? 
Okay, so we're up by Delaware. Interesting. Wow, there's uh, now there. I know there's definitely a ley line that's running down from New York to Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, Virginia that runs down into Georgia. I think it's the Appalachian ley line. Now we could probably use that ley line to uh, clear energy there. I think that's paranormal activity. There's definitely some galactic coding within the street grids and impregnated ones. So much geometry. Mm, I felt a feminine energy being held hostage at the White House as well. Interesting. Wow. Okay. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting one. I'm almost wondering if we should do Washington, D.C. I'm not sure what we should do for the last ceremony. I'm still kind of sitting with ideas. Uh, what do you guys think we should do for the last grid worker ceremony? Should we should we do some of Washington, D.C. to try to get some introspective scope before we do boots on the ground grid work in June, have kind of like an idea remotely what we're going into? I kind of think that might be, I think this might be a good one to do. Um, kind of prepare ourselves. Arlington Cemetery feels like it's needed. Antarctica was cool from our last class. Yeah, Antarctica was cool. It was cool. Uh, maybe we should do the Antarctica one. I mean, we might be able to do two. I mean, we have two class classes. Um, I was thinking we could probably wrap it up, maybe do like one from Antarctica and then do one Washington, D.C., and we could make it all one long class um, or we could take breaks, whatever you guys think. Maybe give me some feedback of what you guys think. Would you want one long session where we just do everything all at one time or take a break? Two separate ones, long one. Okay, we're a little indecisive. One light, one denser. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's, I think doing one Washington DC, one Antarctica, we're going to have some of that contrast for sure. But I don't know. There's a lot of crazy stuff down in Antarctica too. Okay. It looks like two separate. I mean, it is good to take some breaks in between to get some food and recharge yourself. Yes. I agree with that. Um. Okay. So that is pretty much this class. Um, I would say keep continuing to strengthen uh, your ability to remote view over this next month until we get to February 22nd, like keep continue to practice because this skill is going to be much needed. Yeah, uh, she, uh, Cynthia says, Tamanand and William Penn Territory principles were distorted by founding fathers and declaration of independence. Washington hired a Freemason architect to design plans, DC. I was really feeling, yeah, woozy with DC. I just got, I got picked up on that too. And I'm wondering if I even just got a hit. Um, there, I think there's something around the constitution as well. Like the credibility of the constitution, the intention of the constitution, what is still serving, what's not serving within the constitution. I feel like these are things that we could address in like a part of our ceremony, like kind of bringing some resolution, some movement, some change and things that deeply needed should be changed. Um, I want to explain to you guys too, before I go is the visualization that can enhance remote viewing as well. So this is just something you can practice. Uh, but what you do is you take something that is energetically charged. I have my lock screen. <laughs> so you take something that is um, to you is, is active um, with an electrical charge of, of energy. And you're going to place it like three to five feet out in front of you. Okay, you're going to close your eyes 
And then you take a nice deep inhale and exhale breath. And what you're going to do is you're going to actually send a white projection cord from your pineal to that object out in front of you. Okay. And then you're going to actually tie the cord around the object. And then through your breath work, you're just going to inhale and exhale and practice on sending and receiving that energy through the cord from the item back to your pineal, inhaling and exhaling it, sending it back to the item and really just developing a strong etheric cord to that. Okay. Now you're going to kind of practice that like with putting that item a little bit further away. So once you do it three to five feet in front of you, you're going to then put it in another room and then go to another part of the house. And then you're going to really practice sending that through the walls, right? You're going to practice sending it through the doors, like pushing through matter, pushing through obstacles. Um, and then you can even do it like go outside in the backyard, leave it where it is, and then try to push it through the house. Like you're really just kind of opening up psychic passageways for your energy to navigate through matter. And that's strengthening your remote viewing abilities. Um, the next thing you want to do with it is set your item out in front of you. Again, three to five feet. And through your cord, okay, you're now going to intuit a color frequency. So whatever color that comes to you naturally. Are we choosing to do three indigo three grid work projects? I would appreciate one that's indigo one, not both heavy. Yeah, I agree. We need some contrast with that as well. So I actually need some time to sit and think and meditate on these things. I also like to make sure that the places we choose are relative to like current events, relative to things that are going on in the world. So that way we can also be impactful, you know, simultaneously that we're, we're making a difference. So that's why I kind of like to wait till I get just a little bit closer to the date to really choose what exactly the route, the lo target locations are going to be. Um, but yeah, I definitely agree that we need to focus on something that's a little bit more light, healing, activating. Um, and I wish I had an example of that in terms of the homework that was turned in. Even my Vatican one is kind of like an indigo three. So um, yeah, I'll make a point to do that. I think that's a good idea. Um, but with the, the remote viewing technique, so sending the cord, then you're going to tune into a color frequency. So then you're going to say, hmm, connecting with the color green right now. I'm connecting with the heart consciousness, the heart vibrational field. So you're going to pull that green up to the third eye. And now you're going to send green through your tethered third eye core to your item. And what you're doing is you're sending a frequency signal to the item. You're sending a fourth dimensional signal to that item. That is prompting a response. It's prompting um, something to open up. Okay. And so I would recommend sending different colors to your item just experimentally to see if by sending a signal, because the universe operates within these spectrums according to primal language, which is sound, which is color, mathematics. Okay. You could also send numbers too. You could send some sort of signal to your item to see if you get a response. And then if you start to feel electrical charge, you start to feel response, then you're going to kind of open up a window and then allow yourself to go through that window into a remote viewing experience with that response. So if that's kind of making sense for everybody, what I'm explaining, I haven't had to try to explain this to a group of people that I'm not able to like pick up on your guys's like you know, reactions or responses to this. So um, I mean, like visually, because I think it takes like visual attunement for this one to really focus on feeling and seeing through this and really kind of going through that experience. Yeah, you could do it out the window. <laughs> the point is getting farther and farther away and seeing how strong that signal code that you're sending through that um, ethereal tethered cord, right, is um, you're able to keep that 
and send that through distance. She says, excellent technique. Thank you so much. Yes. And um, it's really fun to practice this with someone else too. Like you can um, use a person. I think you can actually get stronger telepathy and stronger remote view if you use a person to do this as well um, by kind of placing your hand on their heart chakra. And then you're going to encode their fifth dimensional impulse or frequency into your chakras. And then um, also create that tethered cord. And then when they leave, you're going to practice sending that signal back and forth and see if you can pick up on the remote view of where they are, what they're doing, things like that. So this is a CTT conscious transformational technique. Yes. Yes, this definitely is. I don't know. I don't think I have this one written down. I'll have to look through some of my notes. If I have it all formatted out, I will put it, I'll post it up for the, like the directions on how to do it. Cause I should have like a step one, step two, step three type of thing. Um, do you do this with eyes open or eyes shut? You can do this either way. I would say eyes closed will allow you to feel and focus more, but if you can do it with your eyes open, are there karmic laws around remote viewing others without permission? That's a good question. That's a good question. I, yeah, I personally don't remote view people without their permission. Yeah, I don't remote view others, friends, family. I would say with the other one, if you're doing it with, a, with another person, you want to make sure you have permission. Make sure that person is cool with you experimenting with them. Although it does pose kind of the bigger question of remote viewing locations, right? Like remote viewing Washington, DC, things like this without permission. Um, so that's a good question. I'm gonna have to really sit with that more and think about it. Again, it's all about intentions. I feel it's about intentions. It's really about making those very clear and then getting the confirmations from the divine as well, that, that the mission and the assignment is necessary. Yeah. Yeah, so this was a really good class today. I hope that this helped you guys um, in some way with um, developing more awareness or consciousness around remote viewing um, as we'll then go ahead and start applying it to our next class, our ceremonial session. I'll make sure to have the itineraries out to you guys a week before um, we do that. So that way everyone can review it. Again, be sure to email me if you're gonna take an active role. I'd love to at least have at least five or six people that want active role. That would be amazing. And yeah, I love you guys so much. It was a beautiful day today. Um, so much awesomeness going on. I had so much fun today. And um, yeah, I'll be sure to, if I have that visualization written out, I will be sure to put it out. If you are on my Patreon, though, I do actually have a video for that one. You just have to scroll down to like 200 posts and you'll find it. <laughs> I approach land space as sentient beings, so it's a relationship. There is permission, but really co-creation, conversion. Thank you so much, Indy. Yeah, it kind of feels like it would be since we're tuning into like organic structures and inor I mean, inorganic structures as well, like that it would be kind of open to like public experience. So I don't see why you know, we'd have to get permission. I mean, I think it's more about working with like the guardian spirits of the land, right? Like who's the guardians of the land and like really calling to those forces um, for our permission. Will it be just as effective to remote view while watching replay of next session? I unfortunately have a work engagement that day. 
Um, I think that, yeah, yes, but it's, it'll probably be more activating to, you know, be able to engage in it. But if you have something else to do, you know, I do understand that as well. And I think you can still gain from the experience. It just won't be live. Tips for coming out of viewing. I think it's really to um, release any attachments that may have came in or came through, um, you know, grounding, yes, clearing your chakras and, um, you know, connecting in with the, the group energy, um, unifying the energy, and then also um, reinstating like um, the mission, like the, like an overall, like the mission and what it was. So that way there's just, you know, it keeps you in that state of clarity of what you're doing and helps you to keep clearing the energy as well. Drink water, eat a bite, help you get more grounded. Yeah. A lot of times when you come out of these sessions, you can be very depleted and shaky um, and just feel like <laughs> I've, I've come out of somewhere I had to immediately go chug water and eat something like immediately I was shaking so bad. Um, it just, cause it's, it takes a, a lot of psychic energy out of you. So yeah, you have to kind of prepare yourself for it. Um, okay guys. So I love you all so, so much. And, um, I hope you have the best rest of your day. I can't wait to see you for the last grid worker session, the ceremonial session. And um, I think it will be amazing. We'll issue certificates and we'll get this ball on the road. I'm hoping to potentially also do another grid worker course um, in, I'm guessing probably July. Um, right now I'm trying to get some other teachers together for it that I think could bring an awesome dynamic piece to this, like pieces of the puzzle that maybe I don't have. So really expanding more. But um, yeah, so we'll have to see. It'll be so cool to try to get this all worked out. But okay, guys, yeah, take care. I love you all. Bye.